All computers on the internet have an address. This is how they're located. It's called the IP, Internet Protocol Address, and in computer terms consists of a binary string of 32 bits, ones and zeros. Although this is convenient for computers, it's not a particularly friendly format for humans to use. So we first split the 32 bits into four 8-bit chunks, or bytes, and then convert the bytes into four more familiar decimal numbers, separated by dots. In fact, it's called the decimal dotted notation. The internet is a military invention. They have the habit of breaking things, or at least making enemies of people who also want to break things. To make the internet more resilient, it is built into lots of interconnected centres and routes that can, in theory, be wiped out at any moment without breaking the whole system. Data is divided at the source into units called packets. Packets can traverse the network taking any route, avoiding bottlenecks or links that have been broken. In fact, the internet is so resilient, it can allow packets to overtake one another and yet be slotted back into the right sequence when it's received at the destination. Given its importance, it's disappointing to discover that the internet appears physically as just a pair of telephone wires, a cable, or best of all, optical fibres. These connect via some form of modem to a gateway or router. The connections on the back of a typical router describe the two classifications of network, the four yellow LAN connections and the single blue WAN connector. The LAN connector, local area network, is that part of the network that is physically close to you within several hundred metres, in your home or school. WAN is the wide area, and this might as well mean the rest of the world. The network connection on the Model B Pi connects to one of the yellow LAN ports. It does not matter which one. By default, the Pi's hardware and software are enabled automatically and set to make internet connection as simple as possible. It does this by assuming that you're using the connection with a gateway router similar to the one pictured. This unit provides a number of details and services that the Pi needs to connect to the internet. The main four are an internet address, an idea of which machines are local and which are remote on the wide area network, where to send data intended for the rest of the world, and how to convert names like www.bbc.co.uk into the binary address string mentioned earlier. To the outside world, the first function of the router is to share the one WAN address amongst all of your connected machines. It does this using Network Address Translation, or NAT table. This keeps track of all the packets as they flow between the internet and the various local addresses. This activity is also useful given the explosion in the use of the internet has led to the current system, version 4, running out of addresses. These details are entered when you configure the router. Let's now look at what the Pi does when it's connected and switched on. The first thing is a call for help. Being mass-produced, it has no idea of where it is. This first special call is answered by the gateway router. Its response contains all of the data necessary to calm the panicking Pi down. It is first given a local address and an indication of the size of the LAN, i.e. who can be contacted locally and finally, where to send packets for the rest of the world. This is normally the address of the gateway router itself. These items are commonly seen on a Windows machine as IP address, subnet mask and default gateway. The fourth item is name conversion. What is the 32-bit binary address of, say, www.bbc.co.uk? The router can pretend to do this itself in which case it will send its own address as that of the DNS, the Domain Naming Service. In fact, in reality, the router can't keep the names of all of the computers on the internet. It actually calls the computers that do, specific DNS machines. This pretend action is called being a proxy. The alternative is for the router to come clean, admit it does not know everything, and send the Pi the addresses of the DNS machines and ask it to make all DNS inquiries to them directly. Space for several of these pointers is usually kept to remove the dependence on just one DNS source. Without DNS, everything else tends to break. You may at this point be questioning the honesty of this rather cheap little router box. If it does not know computer names and numbers, 
How does it know where to send packets? Well, the answer is it doesn't. All it knows is how to pass data on to the next step and hopefully to a machine that does know what it's doing. These are the main routers on the internet backbone. The function of responding to the Pi's original help request uses DHCP, the Dynamic Host Control Protocol. Inside the Pi, the network setup and details are stored, as is usual with most Linux functions, in text files. Run the command cat slash etc slash resolve.conf to see the addresses of the name servers. And finally, you can run a small routine called setup to see and change the network details. The command ifconf, interface configuration, displays the following. eth0 is the first and only Ethernet networking port on the Pi. HW address is a hard-coded MAC address in the device. Again, it has to be unique for every machine. It is this address that the router uses to distinguish between four Pis if they are connected to one router. The IP address is the local IP address of the Pi and the broadcast address is used to send messages to every address in the local addressing range. We will see a lot of this when we start to monitor or sniff networks. The remaining figures accumulate performance information on the network interface. Often small problems can be detected here before they become major failures. Root displays the simple routing table that tells the Pi about the default gateway. Again, the Pi knows as little about the internet and where to send data as the gateway does. Having said that, we have no idea what route a letter we post follows or how a telephone call is routed. Find a friend and connect two Pis onto the same local network. Check your IP addresses using ifconfig. The most basic network test is ping. Type ping and the IP address of the destination. It transmits a small radar-like pulse to see if the other end is connected. It only tests a very basic level of connectivity, but is a very useful quick test. If all is well, ask your friend for their standard username and password. Type slogin username at IP address and you should see. Enter the correct password and you are in. Slogin stands for secure login. It's secure because the details are encrypted as they pass between the two machines. Early versions called Telnet transmitted passwords so that anybody monitoring the network could directly copy the password. We will cover network sniffing later, from a purely academic point of view, of course. It's obvious from the feedback that most people are moving over from Windows. Here are two free utilities you will find useful to connect the Pi to a PC. Putty allows you to connect a terminal screen on your Windows machine. In fact, it's this program I've been using to produce the screens for this presentation. Download and install the PuTTY program. The PuTTY configuration screen looks like this. Enter the IP address and leave the port at 22 unaltered. To save the details, enter a name in the Save Session box. This may well be the IP address of the remote Pi. Click Save to save and then Open to open the text screen. Enter root and the password and you're in. When you've finished, type Brexit. WinSCP is the secure copy facility for connecting your Pi to Windows. Click on the new button and fill in the host name. This may as well be the IP address again. Enter root as the username and the password. Select SFTP, the secure file transfer protocol, from the pull down and tick the SCP, the secure copy, fallback tick box. Click save on the first occasion and then log in. For the first time here you can see your remote filing system in a graphical mode. You can read, write and delete as a root so be very careful what you press. Play. Close when complete. 
I deliberately skipped a description of how the subnet mask works, but again, your pleasing feedback demands that I try, so here goes. Imagine I pull a translucent film backwards and forwards over a 32-bit IP address. If I pull the film leftwards, I uncover one bit, but still have 31 bits covered. If I uncover two bits, 30 remain covered. Uncover three bits and 29 remain covered, and so on. Let's split the 32-bit string into four bytes, as before. Turn the film into a string of ones and zeros and convert the exposed bytes into decimal numbers and you see the following sequence. This sequence is the subnet mask. That's all there is to it. It simply describes where the division in the line as it moves across the 32-bit sequence is. There are some further divisions based on bytes. When it's positioned here, it represents what is known as class A. Here it represents class B, and by this point the pattern's clear. Yes, class C. Another shorthand way is to say class A is slash 8, class B is slash 16, and class C is slash 24, after the number of covered bits. This notation also allows you to specify slash 25, slash 26 if required. That's how the subnet mask is generated, but why generate a subnet mask in the first place? The answer, it would be said, is in the title, Network Division. Consider the two numbers that the 32-bit binary numbers have been divided into. To reduce the discussion, let's only look at the three classes above. In the Class A division, there are 8 bits on the left and 24 bits on the right. In Class B, there are 16 on either side. And Class C is the reverse of Class A, with 24 on the left and 8 on the right-hand side. The decimal equivalence of this division is shown. Don't forget what this 32-bit address is, an address of computer hosts on a network. 32 bits provides 2 to the power of 32 addresses. So the number on the right could be called the host number, and the number on the left called the network number. If you're constantly involved in address allocation or router work, this shorthand is convenient and does reduce the internet, the network of networks, from one massive address range into subdivided networks, or subnets. For quiet life, you could take the top 255 users with the most computers and allocate them a Class A address. The 65,000 medium-sized users could be allocated Class B addresses on which each could place 65,000 hosts. This would leave 16 million Class C networks that could be distributed to users with fewer than 255 hosts in their networks. How easy can network administration become? But there are flies in the ointment. By convention, addresses with all zeros are reserved. Addresses with all ones are a method of contacting every connected device on a network. We saw this as the broadcast address on the Ethernet adapter earlier on. The eagle-eyed of you would also have noticed 127.0.0.1 allocated to. This is the local loopback IP address used for defaults and testing. There are other areas reserved for special activity that we really don't need to worry about at this point. All this does is confuse things and more than halves the number of addresses available. The example above shows you how these numbers come about and we cover it more in a later video. To support the division of classes, the first two bits of the address are also specified. Addresses with the first bits set to 0, 1 are class A, 1, 0 are class B, and 1, 1 are class C. Note that 0, 0 is not used, halving the number of combinations available. In fact, all all zeros addresses are not used. This means that we end up with the following number of networks and hosts. If only we wanted 10 real IP addresses, we could be allocated 194.80.132.0 slash 28. This is the shorthand way of providing an address and a subnet mask. But if we take this address, everything is set apart from the last four bits. These are under our control and shown in this table. So we see our full allocation of 16 combinations, starting at 0000, 000, 000 and working through to 1111. Remember the comments about all zeros. Well, here we can't use 194.80.132.0, as this number is the network number. All networks start on their network number. At the end is all ones, dot 15. This is the broadcast address for use on this subnet. 
The router needs to sit inside the network range to act as a gateway. This leaves only 13 free addresses for our network. Easy to see now how they disappear.